Welcome to Gotta Run With Will. I'm Stacy Creamer. I'm so pleased today to be talking with my good friend, Toby Tanzer, on the occasion of the publication of his book, Running With Destiny. And Toby, I've known you for a while, but I learned so much in this book, which I highly, highly recommend. One of the many things that I learned was what I thought had been the inciting event that caused you to do a lot of charity was not the inciting incident at all. <laughs> it was back when you were 14 years old, you had an experience where you resolved that I decided I wanted to live for worthwhile purpose, not for a personal experience. And I will say, you could read this one of two ways because maybe that personal experience was so terrifying. That's why you wanted to move away from personal experience. But I'll let you talk about it. I'd love to hear it from you. No, it's true. My, my brother, who is around the same height as me, but I was two years younger than him, he was very athletic and wasn't interested in sports, but he was very athletic. And he was very good in rock climbing. I mean, he can type rope walk. He can walk on buildings, those kind of things. And that was not me. You know, I was not interested in such things, but of course, you know, wanting to impress your older brother. So he'd take me rock climbing. And we were, I wouldn't say we were poor, but we didn't have any equipment. We didn't have ropes, we didn't have helmets. And just to go and show off, per se, we'd go to the places where everyone was there with the clips, harnesses, and we'd free, I think they call it free soloing today. In those days, they called it just stupidity. <laughs> And so we'd climb up and then one day, yeah, I got stuck on the rock face. And I thought like, what the heck am I actually doing? Because I don't like rock climbing. And, you know, once again, I get to the top and it's, it's almost like, you know, when you're addicted to something, it's a dead product often. It's like alcohol. Why are you, ad you know, be addicted to love, be addicted to a person, mm. but to a, a rock face. And uh, so I realized, yeah, I'm just doing this just to say, oh, yeah, I got to the top. So I think that was when I got a sense of purpose. And I felt like, let me, let me die for a sense of purpose rather than for an achievement. That's a pretty amazing realization for a 14-year-old kid. Were you an old soul, do you think? No, I think I was just crying on that rock, <laughs> coming, <laughs> thinking like this is. And I could imagine how the falling would feel. And I was just thinking. You say that I, in the book. It's very yeah, palpable. Yeah, when I splatter on the rock, it's going to hurt. And I. I was a rough and tumble kid. I'd had a, quite a few accidents coming up to that stage. So I could imagine the pain I was going to actually feel. And I think it was just those decisions I was going through. And they always say the closer you come to a, a life death experience, the deeper your feelings are. And I think that day really did spoke deeply to me. Interesting, fascinating. So many of our viewers are going to know well your, about your running prowess, and I think, is it a 220 marathon PR? Something under. Say it for real, 219, two, uh, 218. 218. I ran 218, 218 in Berlin Oof. once upon a time. Long Amazing. Time so you started out uh, as a kid, just happened to be in a race, really you know, overperformed expectations, mm -hmm. um, and that started you on your running path, but you kind of toggled back and forth from things involving nicotine and all kinds of stuff. And even once you came um, back to running, you did toggle a little more. So I just am so curious. I think a lot of people sometimes think that elite runners are just like on this path and they you know, are, are, are beyond human. Um, but I'm thinking your path maybe is a little different from that. So I just wondered if you wanted to talk a little about that and when was your last toggle back into a life more, less suited for elite running? No, I think you know, running has always opened doors for me. And that's been the, the main reason why I have run. It wasn't for the purpose of, I mean, I never had goals. People had goals in running say, oh, I wanted to run faster or run this. Actually, I mean, you talk about the marathon. I like the 5,000 meters, which is three miles. I was a short distance runner, really. I mean, we say short. I mean, Carl Lewis and 100 meters. But I liked about three miles, four miles, mm -hmm. that kind of distance. And I just loved the opportunities that running would give to me. So the people that I trained with, they had ideas that they wanted to do this, they wanted to go to that. For me, all I wanted to do was continue this lifestyle of having fun. So I used running only because it opened doors for me, not that I actually had an interest in being a runner per se in that way. Oh, interesting. That, that makes sense then. Yeah. Getting back to near-death experiences of which you've had several, <laughs> mm. the one that I did think had been the inciting incident for, for a lot of your work in really in the last 20 years, and I'm sure our, our viewers will know, be familiar with Shoe for Africa, hospitals in Kenya. The in, talk about the what I see as the inciting incident, although now that I know about your rock climbing experience, it kind of maybe galvanized you to really get on your true path, and that, that, that happened in Tanzania. That was the most horrific, because 
as you know, I was attacked with a machete, and the machete was about this long, and it was a curved blade. And the man just came straight up to me without question or word and sliced down on my forehead. And at the last moment, I put up my hand, and you can, I probably can't see, but I have a scar that runs from here to here. I can see you it. You see? Yeah. And that, that's kind of where the, the machete cut down into, because luckily I got But unfortunately, the other man next to me had the baseball club, and he smacked and he cracked open my skull. And now if you feel my head, I have a dent in the side of my head. I have metal plates actually on both sides of my head, but it's another story. We'll get to that too. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, I went down onto the sand and then I had to run literally to save my life after I'd actually fought off the bandits and actually got the machete back. And then I ran to a place and, you know, I opened the clinic door and there was no medication. There was no antiseptic, anesthetics, there was no antibiotics. And I saw firsthand was an African would feel if they were coming into healthcare per se. But that was in one way, but if I go back to five years before, when I first went to Africa, I remember I was taking a taxi from Nairobi to the airport, which is, you know, like a 20 minute drive. And the driver was driving in a little beat up taxi. It was like a $2 taxi, well, not even an official taxi. And he kept on looking at my shoes. And in Kenya, they pronounce Nike Nikes. So he was going, that's a nice pair of Nikes. And I'd already given all my possessions away. The shoes I wore on my feet was the only thing I had. So I was telling him, ha, 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 I'd give you them, but unfortunately I don't have any of them. And he said, I could change my life if I had those. Mm. And I thought back to myself how in my first race, I won a Nike contract and I'd had free shoes for the rest of my life. <laughs> Up until today, I think I bought two pairs of shoes in my entire life mm. for running. And so that thought that this person was saying those shoes, and it was like a slap in the face because those shoes had changed my life too. So, that thing of also giving him the shoes, really that was more for me how it kind of started because I realized something simple as giving away your shoes can change somebody's life. So more than the Zanzibar event, I think the event inside the taxi with the unknown taxi driver. That's amazing, I love that. But just to be clear, mm. in Zanzibar, you were left just with the one shoe. Hence, right. when you did establish the charity, bringing shoes to Africa, it's shoe for Africa, not shoes for Africa. Losing one but shoe was the name of the charity, it, yeah. Exactly, but be clear, people were getting pairs of shoes. <laughs> and I hopped along one. the beach, and if you can imagine the most painful run in your life, that was my most painful run. You mm. know, I've done heel repeats with world champions, I've done track sessions with Olympic champions. I've been really, really, down in training, you know, really suffered a lot. But that run along the beach with a cracked skull, and I couldn't see, and I had my bare foot in the sea to make sure I was actually running in the right direction, and I lost all senses of, you know, what was around me. And it took me 11 days to get out of Africa, and I started to go crazy day after day, you know, I was losing my senses. I couldn't feel on my left side of my body, even though the attack was on my right side, and I'm here. Well, and to be clear, you weren't, even you weren't really aware of how severely you'd been injured. True. I mean, you had, we're traveling with a partner that wasn't maybe the most sympathetic <laughs> person to be in that, True. the most worse than the attack, but that's another story too. But when you finally did get out, talk about that and what happened, because you really needed some serious surgery. Yeah, had the luck of the all gods by meeting on the actual night of the millennium, I met an Indian doctor who told me, and it was very funny because I was on this decrepit state where I couldn't even talk properly without you know, having two sentences and I'd have to stop. I think you put pause. your pants on backwards at one point. I did. And the T-shirts also, everything was, it was just discombobulated and I couldn't tell mm -hmm. the difference left or right. And this Indian doctor who I thought was going to give me the pill to cure myself came and said, like, there's a reason why you came to Africa. I was like, yeah, yeah, I got robbed from my Nike shoes. No, 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 there is a reason you'll discover later in life and I was expecting to be Getting cured chills. and he was just His telling me. in here. <laughs> yeah and he was just telling me there is a reason why you I'm on your journey. So then I felt like yes and then by the luck of all gods I don't know how he managed you know he was walking around all the places in Dar es Salaam you know we went over the mainland and he was begging to the travel agencies to fly me out of Africa because all the flight tickets were fully booked after the millennium mm. and my ticket wasn't even from Zanzibar my ticket was from Kenya. And then in one of the last places he visited, he looked at the name badge of the lady inside the travel agent and he said, I delivered you 27 years ago. <laughs> I mean, what are the chances of that? <laughs> he recognized the family oh name. Oh my gosh. In and your life, this happens a lot. <laughs> but <laughs> the fact that he said like, now uh, I brought you into the world, now you owe me a favor. So she switched the tickets. She illegally went amazing. into the computer, switched the tickets and I had a passage out. So 11 days later, I landed in, uh, in I was going to say New York because it feels like home. I went home to England. It wasn't home for me, but I am English. 
So when I was in England, I got to Stansted Hospital, and then when I went to Stansted, they told me, no, 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 this is too complicated, so I was rushed to Charing Cross. And when you landed, they didn't even want your mother to get near you. They wanted to no. rush you to the hospital. They thought I was, I was so close to, I was like literally on the last talk of the clock. So I was lucky. I mean, you know, I've had so much luck in my life. Even the fact that they stole my left shoe. Had they stolen my right shoe, I wouldn't have been able to kickstart my motorbike because I also had oh, to drive yeah. myself to them. Unbelievable. So then, galvanized by both your cab driver and by your doctor, who saw that you had a bigger destiny and that's why you're in Africa, you mm. then launched Shoe for Africa. Tell me about that. You know, I always wanted to be a helper. To be honest, I like spending money on myself. And, <laughs> Don't we <you> know, all? <laughs> Most of us. And I suddenly, you know, and I felt like I was being presented with all these, you know, things in life. I mean, like, for instance, 9-11, you know, I was running past in the morning, all these different things, and then I had a mentor for the New York City Marathon, she died of cancer, and I kept on thinking, like, why me? Why am I always the one surviving all this? And I thought I have to do something with my talents, you know, rather than just do something for myself, because running is a very self-serving sport. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I'd love to do something for other people. And I was sponsored, so I got free running shoes. I thought, what better than just give away what I'm being given for free? And I had so many people asking me for running gear. I thought, mm, why not lend? And I didn't like charities at all. I said, let me just start a project where, you know, and I have a lot of running friends who are very good runners who also knew of groups of very needy people. Mm -hmm. So I just started sending off shoes, collecting shoes. But let me tell you, it ballooned like a way I could never imagine. Yeah. The most offered shoes I've got from one person was 60,000 shoes. How did one person come by 60,000 shoes? He was a manager for a rock band, and he had three sold-out shows at um, Madison Square Garden for 20,000 each night. So he said, I'm going to mandate that every single person has to have shoes to cut in, you know. Because the funny thing is, you know, I live in two worlds. When I'm in Africa, where I live with my friends in Africa, people have one pair of shoes. You know, you don't choose which pair of shoes. À cette occasion, j'ai eu la chance de faire du bénévolat pour l'association Shoes for Africa, qui organise chaque année, la veille de Noël, une course de 5 km entièrement réservée aux femmes. But I know me in America, I look at my closet and it's like, okay, which pair am I going to wear today type of thing. So we can all contribute a pair of shoes if we're asked. So shoes, getting shoes was never a problem. I was actually overwhelmed with shoes and I never realized how popular it would become in such a short period of time. Well, what I love through the book, I keep thinking if this charitable thing wasn't working out for you, you are a marketing genius and you're so inventive in the various things you try and not everything works but you're utterly indefatigable and, and just relentless in trying the next thing, trying the next thing. Tell me a few of the marketing ploys you've tried or connections with people or even a guy like that where he suddenly can deliver 60,000 shoes. I always think that opportunities always come to all of us and it's whether we say yes or whether we say mm -hmm. no to them. And I had a big mentor when I was young, this Indian man who walked on the walks with um, Gandhi who at that time when I was very young, it didn't really mean anything to me. It was only later in life. Mm -hmm. But he always used to tell me, why not? Why not? <laughs> Whenever we, like, you know, <laughs> so I believed I could do anything. He was like, why not? You know, it seemed like that answer that opened the highway for you. So always whenever a situation comes, I always try and think, like, what can I get out of this and what can... So one day, for instance, I'll give you an example. I, uh, when I started the charity, Hewitt Packard were... They've got five prongs to their charitable ideas. One is education, one is healthcare, one is something else, blah, blah, blah. But Serena Williams does the education, but nobody does healthcare. So I thought, hmm, why don't I ask Venus then if she can be the one for Hewitt Packard to do healthcare? Because Venus had said, I mean, Serena had said, opening a school in Kenya with Hewitt Packard was one of the biggest highlights of her life. Mm. So I thought, well, da da. How about she, uh, Venus opens the Venus Hospital in Kenya, and I get Venus to have the naming rights. I put up the funds, and all she does to put is her name. So I thought, how do I meet Venus? 
So I went to a party and there was Serena. So I thought, okay, let me go and talk to Serena. <laughs> so I'm walking up and Serena is actually about the same height as me, but I'm like uh, a little, my build is not. <laughs> a little <laughs> slighter. <laughs> I was just about to ask her. And then somebody to the right shouted, Serena. And she went boom with her elbow. I went flying past two, you know, it was a restaurant like a thing, but I, I never got the chance to see her. So I thought, okay, now can I do it? So at that stage, Tony, my friend, had met Billie Jean King. So Billie Jean King agreed to have breakfast on the Upper West Side. So when I met Billie Jean King, I said like, you know, da da da, I've got this idea, Venus, reach for the stars, da da da, like this. So I, I would always come, whatever, whoever I met, who I felt was a facilitator, I would always just make the direct ask to them. Mm -hmm. And most of the ones didn't turn out. Mm -hmm. I mean, I also, I tried with Djokovic. And just it was opportunities when I met these people. And as you know yourself, I mean, more, perhaps better than I do, in New York, these opportunities are there. If I'd stayed in Iceland, where I used to live, I'd, I wouldn't have these Not opportunities. opportunities like so really, this. all I did was, wherever I am in a, a place, I actually look for the opportunities around me. And I find wherever you are, there are opportunities. You just have to put them together for whatever you're, you're doing. And I think people, especially the ones who really get most involved with you, get so much out of it. I was really struck by one part where you um, are talking about other charities and how many charities, you don't realize it, but they just take your check and even give it to another charity, whereas you're actually doing the, the work, and we'll get into it, but you're building two hospitals in Kenya in addition to the Shoe for Africa project, or that's still part of it, I guess, but you know, this shoe effort is something separate. And um, it really made me think, I was wondering what advice you would give to someone like me. Mm -hmm. um, you clearly, you know, from 14, you had a mission, you had a vision, you didn't know the details of it, and that kind of unfolded as you had your adventures in Africa. Um, what do you suggest to people who do want to help, who maybe, or want to have more purpose beyond just giving, writing a check? Writing a check's a good thing, because mm. we wouldn't have, you know, hospitals if people hadn't written generous checks and little checks and all kinds of checks. But what do you, who, who, for people who feel that urge to have more purpose in their lives, but aren't ready to commit their entire lives. Any, any advice? Well, first of all, Stacey, you are a big helper. <laughs> and I know and you, you are sponsoring schoolgirls. And so, I mean, I'm talking to a person that, uh, so well, but thank you for scaled. The, <laughs> the work know. you do. I, I think it's, I mean, I think when I was young, doing something was what counted. Mm -hmm. You didn't, and then sadly, I think in some ways the internet has kind of spoiled us in the fact that everybody wants to be, you know, Bono or anything like that. Just, for me, giving a pet, I'm always motivated by the little things. Like a friend of mine who, who lives in Kenya, he's an Italian running coach, and he said, I always put, whenever I have spare change, I put it on the windowsill, and then once in a while I scoop it up, and then when I'm driving, I look, and, and those kind of things inspire me so much. That I think there's goodness in everyone, and mm -hmm. every single person wants to be a helper. It's just, how do we? And I agree, I mean, I used to give to charities, and then I found out that the board flew to the Bahamas for a board retreat. And I was thinking like, all the donations I give, and as you know, for instance, for the New York City Marathon, there's a lot of charities. And even if you run the marathon and raise all the money, where does that money go? The, the CEOs of these charities, you can run 10,000 marathons. You probably won't even pay one year's salary for them. So I tried to say in charity, your money goes directly to the cause. Mm -hmm. In so much to the stage that I will actually, like for instance, a friend of mine, Michelle, donated $50 the other day. And so I'll go to Kenya and I'm buying uniforms for her and I'll take a picture of the girl and me giving the uniforms yeah. to her because I think that's what keeps donor retainership. You know, if you realize that your money is going somewhere, and I'm the kind of person that when I grew up, charity workers were poor. Mm -hmm. We were all just like, you know, we did it because we loved what we were actually doing. We didn't do it for the money. But something has changed now that the average charity CEO salary is like a six figure plus high. Mm. And people are saying, well, you know, I do this work, da, da, da. But everyone loves to do charity work. We should be the lowest paid people because we all love to do charity work. So I, I think it's that, you know, get involved with the person that's actually running the charity. And if they're not prepared to give you time, then find a charity where people are. Because, you know, as a givers, our charities wouldn't exist without kind donors. That's the truth of the matter. I am who I am today in my charity world because of the people that have supported me. So I'm a servant to them. Mm -hmm. 
I really do agree, though, that you're able to then, you know, the woman who's giving $50 will be able to see tangibly, you'll be able to shoot her a picture when you get back of, mm -hmm. of what actually that meant. So I really love that. There's a picture of a grandmother getting, you're giving her shoes in a, in a book that really meant a lot to me. She's like, oh, these are for me. And I, I think the idea of really taking it down to that person to person contact is so meaningful. So that I can see how that would be really feel great as, 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 a, as a giver. But I'm still, be, I would be more inspired to, in addition to perhaps writing the check, actually doing something and participating. And maybe that's in the way of some of the races you've held here or something like that, volunteering, but doing some actual work I mean, it takes work to be able to write a check, but even just work to help a charity. Are there opportunities at all like that in well, your? Well, Stacy, you are a fantastic runner. I mean, <laughs> you know, we're talking to a, a world champion age grouper here age, who's accent on age. Group. So you really should come to Kenya. I mean, mm. I'll give you an example. In Kenya, uh, 10 meters from my front door lives David Rudisha, who is the mm. world record holder for the 800 meters. We just got I saw another. I him get that record. There you see, in 2012. Yep. And then we just got a piece of land where we're building a house, and my 400 meters away is Elliot Kipchoge. Mm. So if you come to this place as a runner, it's like runner heaven for you. You would not believe that. You know, you go running in the morning, it's who don't you meet? Mm. And so I think I always tell people, if you can travel to actually see where you're going to help. And, you know, I mean, I'm a supporter of many charities. And for a long time, you know, I was working with charities in New York. If you actually see the people that you're helping, and of course, it's very bad for me because to actually get somebody to Kenya is different. Yeah. But I feel that once you go there and you see it, make the lifetime trip. And that's, you know, I wish I could get to everybody too, because yeah. Kenya changed my life dramatically. Yeah. And it actually, you know, I mean, the two sides of the coin almost. I was one person, then I flipped over after seeing. I mean, I went to Africa to try and run, only to run. Mm -hmm. But what I saw changed me in a most dramatic way and opened my eyes to actually realizing it was not just what I read anymore, it's what was actually in my... That's so fantastic. And thank you. I will take you up on that. I will come to Kenya sometime. I would love to. And I do, I do love, I'm sure a lot of people who are watching um, uh, feel this way, and I, I know I do, I bet you do too, you just pretty much said it. You, you, the purpose is running and you're going to go run this race or you're going to go do this, train for this or train for that. It's really everything along the way that winds up being so beautiful and numinous and wonderful and just the people that you meet. And the, the real memories I have are of those parts along the way, not the actual, oh, and I did my PR at this, you know. I mean, that's nice too. And it's no, nice to go for that. But it's really the connections that we can make. You're absolutely right. It's a journey and it's a life journey. It's a story, if you think. And I used to coach this lady in 2006. She's a famous actress, but I'll pronounce she's Cara Bueno. And she's an amazing actress. I mean, she was in Mad Men, Sopranos, Gladiators, Stranger Things, whatever she goes in. And I remember when I was coaching her for the marathon and she said, it was the journey. She said, like, when I came to the finishing line, it wasn't that medal on the finishing line, but it was remembering the journey to get there. Yeah. And I think that's the beauty of running. And when I stand, for instance, on the starting line of the New York City Marathon, what really gets me is the power of thinking I've got 50,000 people with me who have all got these individual stories about broken collarbones, broken feet, you know, argument with the wife or missing Sunday, not taking the kids out, you know, these sacrifices. We all have these personal stories. And I think that's the beauty in humankind. We're all this incredible story. And I can sit down with a street champ in London and just start chatting to a guy and you'll hear the most amazing things. And that's, we're such, every single person on this globe has a story to tell. Absolutely. And that's the beauty of it. And that Absolutely. through running, I think it just, brings us together. But my charity is not just running. We also do tennis. We have Zainab, one of my board members. She was a professional tennis player. Mm. And now we have Aces for Africa. And so we have a fundraiser through tennis. It's just trying to get people involved rather than, like you say, and just writing a check, but get involved in some way. And we encourage people, do an event of yourself. You know, like, for instance, we've had somebody who did a waffle, waffle making thing or, you know, like oh, great. just fun little things. Because I think everybody likes to reach out to your community and what better excuse hey i'm helping you know kids with cancers over in africa i'm doing this event and already you've got your audience yeah so whatever walk of life you're in i mean people i truly believe every single person wants to help i think so too i really yeah. i really do it's just connecting with the right opportunity i guess or making the opportunity
So at what point did you decide shoes aren't enough or we're going to do more than just shoes? We need hospitals <laughs> in Kenya. The funny thing, people say, like, how did you decide to build a hospital? And I'll tell you, 9 o'clock on the morning of March the 15th, 2008, I had no intention in the world to build a hospital. <laughs> but two hours later, I had committed to building a $15 million <laughs> hospital. That's, that's that. how ridiculous it is. Well, not ridiculous for you, because you've already you got the aspiration. You, you know, you're looking for what it is, maybe. So tell me about those two hours. What happened in that interview? Well, first time? of all, a prelude, it was the worst timing in the world, because I just launched I was actually on the board for the New York Roadrunners Company, which might sound a bit of a conflict, but I'd started a, a company called the Manhattan Marathon <laughs> with an Israeli billionaire. So yes, he's a colorful like a, character. And plus I had all the, all the top characters in my Rolodex who I could actually launch this with. We were in motion. We were in motion to have mm -hmm. the Manhattan Marathon. And it was just going so well. And then suddenly, on this morning, I went to see a church that had been burnt to the ground on 1st of January. Mm. And this was, you know, I was living in Kenya at the time during the political violence. And it wasn't the first church that was burnt down. There was other churches burnt. And no, the country was just, in, it was like a mini Rwanda with the Hutsis and the Tutsis, except in Kenya with different tribes. And so these tribes were getting at each other. And I was living very close to where the rebel tribe basically was. And remember on January the 1st, we heard this news flash, and I can't remember the exact wording, but the news broadcaster said, this is Kenya's darkest day. Mm -hmm. You know, today, between 35 and 50 women and children are being burnt alive inside a church. Mm -hmm. And I, I just thought like, well, you know, I'm going out for a run in the morning. I'm going, what, what am, where am I living? How can this happen right on my doorstep? You know, a morning's runaway, I can go to and this I'm sure place. it didn't feel like your Kenya. Like your Kenya Yeah, is not the Kenya that. I love. And the people that I know there too. And of course, it was just a group of yobs that did this. It wasn't a reflective of the country in itself, but it was just like such a shock. So when I went to the church, you know, a few weeks later to actually, because I kind of tried to forget about it, but it just kept on coming back to me, coming back to me. So I took the, the car of somebody and we went and actually hunted out where the place was. And when we went, the, the clear-up had not been so good. You know, there's still bones on the ground, bits of charred, this, it was, and signs of life. And one of the men who was showing me around had actually been in that community and actually ran and hid. So he was able to give me a very, very graphic description. And then he said, talk to that lady if you want to know really what happened. And I said, like, what? Looking around the ruins. And sure enough, in the corner, this lady was praying at where the altar used to stand. And so I went to talk to her only because my guide was crying so badly, having his memories relived, and I felt really bad for bringing back and I think, like, why the heck did I even ask to be here? And this lady then started telling me the story about how all the houses had been burnt down, so they'd grabbed a mattress and they were now living outside the perimeter of the church. And she said, on January the 1st, we heard this big, you know, rumbling of this mob coming along with machetes and waving, so we ran inside the church to hide. Mm -hmm. She said, they took our mattresses, they blocked up the door and they blocked up the windows. And then she said, we smelt gasoline, so they'd brought gasoline with them. And then the church set on fire. And then the roof started coming down and some of the windows with the, ma the mattresses, of course, burnt through. So some of the boys, the stronger boys, tried to jump through the windows. But outside, the people had machetes oh. and they were hacking them. So they were either jumping back in or, you know, falling on the outside. Then one guy from the rebel tribe said, no, no, enough, enough, this is crazy, get, you know, let everyone out. So she took her opportunity, she ran outside the church, but unfortunately she realized her three-year-old child, Miriam, was still inside the church. So she dashed back in taking a, a scarf to cover for the smoke. She picked up Miriam, but when she got to the gate the, at the church, she tried to get outside, but a girl, lady from her own tribe, pulled onto her skirt and said, don't leave me, don't leave me, don't leave me. So she was holding Miriam, trying to, she couldn't get free, and she was telling this woman, <laughs> let's get out. But the woman, I don't know, maybe she couldn't get up. So she took little Miriam and she threw Miriam as far as she could into the tall grass while she fought with this lady to mm. get rid of her. And unfortunately, the mob picked up little Miriam, who was three years old, and threw her back into the worst of the furnace. So she burnt to death. Oh. Now, it was so horrific. I didn't know what to do. Like, how do I help her? Do I give her money? Do I, you know, and she lives in a refugee camp, no, not a refugee, an internally displaced person's IDP camp with, you know, 20,000 people with similar stories. 
And she wasn't getting any counseling or anything. So I was thinking, how can I help her? And I was telling her, oh, I'm so sorry. This is, and she said, and she looked at me straight in the eyes and she said, no, there is a meaning for this. Yeah, she yeah. Says, there is a me- <laughs> it's like, <laughs> like a movie. <laughs> yeah, you're telling me this. It should be me telling you. So she goes, no, 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 there is a meaning for this. There is a meaning. And I was thinking, wow, that is exactly the same as eight years ago, what the doctor had That's told me. That's what I thought of right away. There is a meaning for this. And I'm thinking like, only in my culture, you know, when, when my culture, something bad happens, it's because of, you know, a scary animal, a mean human, <laughs> like a disaster of nature. But she's telling me, no, no, there is a meaning for this. God knows the meaning for this. So I'm wa- my head is kind of spinning around what to do, what to do. I just wanted to get out of there anyway. So I told my friend, let's go back into Eldoret. We didn't talk. He's driving. I'm like we shared some kind of secret. We're just mm-hmm. sitting there like what? To-? And I said, just drop me off in town. And like you, I'm a big coffee drinker. I said, <laughs> I need a cup of coffee. So I went to a cafe and it was actually the cafe of a famous runner, the guy who won the 100th Boston Marathon who I used to train with, Moses Tanui. So I thought, Let me, maybe he's home and maybe he'll be in the cafe, you know, he can. So I sat down and I'm drinking my cup of coffee and my Dutch friend and his wife, Peter Langehorst, came into the, the cafe and the wife was talking to somebody at the door. So Peter walked straight across to me and he was carrying in his arm like this brochure thing under his arm. And he put it down on the table like between us now and said, do you want to do this? And then he pushed it aside and started telling me about a brand new car that he'd bought, which is obviously more <laughs> exciting than this. Uh, it was the first co- new car he'd bought. But I was looking at the wording and it was saying proposal for, and I was like, what is that? And he goes, ah, forget it. And he kept on talking about this new gold car he'd got, blah, blah, blah. And I said, no, 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 what, what's the proposal for? You know, because I was still in shell yeah. shock from yeah. this person. I couldn't really talk about cars. And he said, what do you believe? He said, like, Everyone, you know, we want to help, you know, heal Kenya because Kenya was really, you know, fractured at this time. So he said, I asked the local doctor, how can I help? Expecting like a $200 contribution, like, you know, buy flowers for some patients or something like that. He said, would you believe the crazy lady returned with a $15 million proposal to build a children's hospital? He's like, I'm, you know, like, I'm going to throw it in the, the garbage. And I was like, on a morning like this? Are you kidding me? And suddenly, all these things kept on going to my mind, starting back from that 14-year-old, these events, and how lucky I was. And when, when I was 11 years old, I fell out of the roof of a theater, and I broke you know, And had every a very lucky experience here. having a doctor appear who your arm was going to be set permanently yeah, at like a that. right angle if it weren't for him. So imagine that, having public child health care of such a degree and thinking like, you know, all these obligations I'd got in life because of all these things, and thinking like, on this morning being given this, so then and there, I took the proposal and said, you know what, let me try to do it, which at that time was now saying no to the Manhattan Marathon. So now I've got a billionaire partner who says, come on, we'll finance, let's start this race in Manhattan, or I've got the hospital. I can't do both of them. Yeah. I have to make a decision. And I thought, okay, well, What do I like about charity? I like the fact that if everyone gives something, it goes 100%. So I said, let me work for free. That would be my only selling point because I don't have anything else. I'm not a doctor. I'm not an architect. I don't have any talents. The only thing I've come to do is say, (laughs) by hook or by crook, I'm going to build a team to do this. And if you give me money, which turned out badly, let me say, we will get to that point. So it was a very... It was a morning like no other I'd had in my life, that's for sure. But it came out, you know, 11 o'clock, I'd committed to building this. And at that stage, it was going to be a 250-bed children's hospital and the first public in Eastern Central Africa. Oh, unbelievable. And it's just amazing. I'm not really a big one for grand design, but boy, (laughs) it sure seems, I mean, the events that got you at that moment, you know, but still, but you're the one who had to, be up for doing it, even well, even when it was literally almost handed in your lap, just at least the idea, the plans. You there know, was, there were so the many little things. Like, for instance, in 2007, I had a women's football team in Nairobi, and one of my players uh, had AIDS. And I went to visit her in hospital, and she was so emaciated and lying there, and lying there and they're saying, and she said to me something, she said, oh, I'm so happy when you come and see me, because then I get medicine. I'm like, what? She said, no, you know, on the days that you're, you don't come, I won't get medicine. But when they see you coming to visit, 
Mm. And I was thinking like, wow, how can it be? And the problem is, is you know, we, we think it's a, a lack of compassion. But I remember asking a doctor in Kenya about what is his problem. He said, we're at 150% occupancy in our public hospitals, 150% or more. He says, if I save one adult, that means there aren't 10 orphans on the street tomorrow. Mm. But if I save one child, he didn't oh, finish the wow. sentence. Yeah. And when you think of it like that, you start to understand that, you know, we can't judge other societies unless we actually live in it. Mm. I mean, I have a lot of friends who say, oh, New York is the most fantastic city. And I said, have you actually lived in other cities? Because, you know, we go on holiday to places or something, but until you actually live inside a country, you can't really. Mm -hmm. It's like the saying, or whatever, walk a mile in a person's shoes type but of thing. But you have to do it where they live too. <laughs> Absolutely, and you've got to live there. And I think, you know, one of my perspectives have been, I've lived in five countries. And I really, f I feel like I'm a visitor my whole life. I've mm. never actually felt that I've actually lived in a certain place. So I see things in a different way, I think, to mm. others. And being in Kenya and seeing the healthcare and seeing, I mean, Kenya has 4% of the GDP going to healthcare. Whereas, for instance, in Britain and America, it's 17.5%. So we can't just say to Kenya, oh, yeah, throw more money at the problem. It just doesn't have that money inside the, you know, some countries don't. It's what can we do? Mm. Mm, absolutely. Well, ironically, since you are such a, an advocate for health care, especially for, for children who were getting maybe less of it, understandably, in Kenya, uh, you yourself had an experience that pointed to the lack of health care maybe for people in this country. Um, yet another brush with death on Fifth Avenue with, with a car going, I still can't believe it, the wrong way on Fifth Avenue. When does that ever happen? I've only seen it once in my life. Yeah, but let's, let's keep it at that. Let's <laughs> yeah. keep it at once. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that experience, which was a little bit more recent. Yeah, it was October the 7th, 2013. I was cycling down Fifth Avenue and I'd got four fundraising meetings to go to. One at like five o'clock, one at six o'clock, one at seven o'clock, and one at eight forty-five. And just to be clear, you haven't taken a cab in at least twenty years of New never York. in my You're life not, have yeah, I taken yeah, a, a cab inside New York City. And funny, <laughs> I've worked for other charities, and I refuse to waste donors' money. So I'll walk or go on a subway or go on a Love bicycle. that. Yeah. In fact, the subway for me was a luxury. There was a time when I never even would go on the subway. Now I'm getting a little bit old and cranky. <laughs> so, yeah. so I'm cycling down the. And can you believe this car, there's a space between 115th and 112th where you can't go west, you have to go east. And there's like a firehouse and shit. So what the car was doing was it was scooting the wrong way, driving up Fifth Avenue against the traffic to try and get onto 150th so it could slip west directly. And I think the car driver saw the barreling traffic of three lines coming towards it and then him going the wrong way. And it didn't see me on the side of the road. I saw him very clearly, but I was kind of in shock that this was going on and I couldn't get any, there was no way I could get out of the way. And he hit me and I know because there was a, a witness five cars back, I went to the height, I spun up to the height of the traffic lights. I spiraled around and had the good luck to land on the other side of my head. <laughs> to where well, the, at least you have titanium already on the other side. Maybe but that they'd moved. Been the problem was that they'd moved. I mean, titanium, it's... Uh, Maybe it's all the x-rays I go through when I go through the airport as it like moves around a little bit. Oh. But yeah, they told me because my neurosurgeon was amazed. The first question he said when I actually came out of brain surgery, he writes, what the hell happened on the other side of your head? I mean, forget this accident. <laughs> and the miracle was when I actually had the injury in 1999, I had a very, very slow bleed. It was dripping very, very slowly. But this was like the Niagara Falls. <laughs> And, that's and the good? neurosurgeon, well, the neurosurgeon told, he told me, had you had this accident in Africa, you'd be dead because one hour you had, that was the window to get, you know, fixed up. But I fell between two great hospitals, Harlem Hospital and Mount Sinai. So, and ironically, the one to go to <laughs> was the one close to my apartment. And had more, well, you wanted to go there because it was closer to your apartment, but actually they I'd deal with more head there. trauma. They do, yeah. Mount Sinai. They are actually out. perfect for trauma injury. So that was another weird, weird thing. And yeah, I was convinced I'd be discharged. Well, and several doctors, night. including one I know, Michele Tagliatelli, uh, yeah. who's on Central Park Track Club, looked at your scans and didn't think it was someone who could have survived. That was the amazing thing. And I think I put that down to my active lifestyle. And funny, I was in Seattle two days ago, and my friend was saying, all my friends bike for 
pleasure or on the weekend, but I always biked for transport. Practicality. Yeah, and so I was either running for fun or I was biking to get somewhere. And I think I've just been very, very active. And my whole life, I mean, I was one of those kids that early in the morning I was out the door and I didn't come home until the sun, mm -hmm. you know, well, mm -hmm. not even the sun, until you know, it was actually bedtime. I've always been a very, very active person. And I'm convinced that that actually helped me to heal because I think that might be a little divine uh, mm -hmm. in here too. And good Your luck. mission is not nearly over, is my feeling. So and good luck. I've had just so much good luck. Just incredible. So. But now, what was your health insurance status at that point in time? That was another miracle. <laughs> you know, I had never had health insurance in the whole of yeah. my life. Building two hospitals for children in yeah. Kenya, but no coverage for you. I never had health insurance until 2012, which was exactly one year before this accident happened. Didn't have health insurance, and I just went fly back. And I remember once I came back from Mombasa, and my whole arm was black because I got bitten by this odd insect, and I just it went brown. And I remember lying in on First Avenue in my apartment, thinking like, if I get to 104, I'm going to the hospital. And I was sweating profusely because that's the fear of an immigrant. You know, you fear the medical costs. I had a friend who dropped out in the New York City Marathon. He got taken to Lenox one night for a stomach aches. It was a nine thousand yeah. dollar bill. So we, as immigrants, we know these fears. So but it's not just immigrants; it's people who are here already and true, don't have health insurance. True, there are absolutely. plenty of those people too. So uh, many of us. So yeah. in 2012, what happened was I was working for another charity, doing work, and the guy, the CEO of the charity, asked me. He said, "Like, you know, you raise all this money for these other charities because you know I was not a fundraiser for this other charity." Mm -hmm. He says, "Why don't you raise some money for me?" So in about a month, I raised about 200,000. I mm -hmm. brought in some very big donors for him and you know came in with some big pledges and things like that so he said I you know you've done so much like maybe I can pay you back by giving you health insurance and I was like yeah <laughs> and he said he knew somebody who had got into an accident <laughs> Ian Brooks exactly. oh, almost yes. died yeah no health insurance well and it the yeah. accident saved him so exactly because he had cancer and he right no but so he said you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to put you on our company insurance for so I'm like, yeah, I don't need it. You know, I'm, I'm building a hospital. I'm going to be fine. And then sure enough, the one time in my life, well, one of the times I needed it. And then, but still, yeah, no, it was still expensive. So, you know, like yeah. the, the other costs that you get for Absolutely. such an accident. Because the person that hit me didn't have, he had a bankrupt insurance. So, and he didn't even get a ticket even though the police saw him. Can you believe? Well, the police didn't really do much, unfortunately, it seemed no. at the time either. What no, I, I have a feeling, I don't know, and of course, you know, this is all the world according to me. I have a feeling, because there were local police, they were like the neighborhood police. I, I think they actually knew the driver. Oh, and so and that's when they went. And I think that may have what it, they may have recognized it, because how else did he? And they also changed the, the scene of the crime. They said, I was the one at fault. I was cycling on Madison, going the wrong way against traffic. Luckily, my witness <laughs> had a, Dan, a camera. Yeah, Dan, Dan, Dan Daly, my Samaritan, who picked me up from the road. He drove past. He thought I was a goner because he saw how high I came and came yeah. down. But I blinked oh, when he drove oh past. Gosh, so he stopped. <laughs> wow. And so he said, no, he, he gave me. And so we sent the, with the evidence to the police and said, no, I wasn't cycling illegally. But had Dan driven past and had I died, you know, had I not got medical <laughs> care, Everyone would have said, oh, that stupid idiot was cycling the long, right, the long way right, against right. traffic on, served him right to die. Oh, so for me, that was a big, because I always felt like, and I still feel, I mean, 99.9% of the police are good, good people. And I'm the first to call 911 if there's a problem, believe you me. But I always think in life, you know, that you are protected by a certain force. And lying on the tarmac at that time, I started to think like, am I... I mean, here I am, I give out shoes and I get hacked to death for giving shoes. Now I'm building a hospital. Now I'm going to a hospital. Am I, do I have something wrong with a picture? Or am I just believing so much that they're showing me, no, it's not true. You're not looked after by some godly force or something. Mm. Mm. Well, you did have a few guardian angels come through on that one. So Thank goodness. Thank goodness. Was... Thank goodness. Goodness. Yeah. yeah. So um, more, I would say, of divine providence is uh, evidenced by how you met your wife, which really surprised me because I had assumed, oh, Kenya, blah, 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 blah. But no, <laughs> it's even a more bizarre and extreme way that you met her. Tell me about that, Isn't that even though I know. Weirdest? But tell our uh, audience. Well, if
she's Kenyan mm -hmm. and dark skinned, very dark skinned. And everyone said, ah, that's the reason why you're doing the stuff in Africa. No, 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 no. Oh, not yeah. even that. But like, I mean, you didn't even meet her through running or in Kenya. It was <laughs> she was in Seattle complaining about a big phone bill. She had a $700 phone bill. <laughs> And so she was in this, the T-Mobile store about to complain. Oh, guys. <laughs> and the lady said behind the till, she said, well, if you've got a complaint, why don't you talk to the CEO of T-Mobile? Because he's standing there. And she was like, so she marched straight over and she said, started to talk to him. And of course, like, you know, he asked her, where are you from? And she said, I'm from Kenya. And he said, wow, wouldn't you believe my friend <laughs> is building a hospital in Kenya. So... <laughs> He said, like, so she said, like, wow, where, where is this hospital in Kenya? You know, she wanted to know. So he says, Eldoret. And he goes, like, my God, I was born in Eldoret. So she said, I have to see, you know, because she knows the town. It's a small yeah. town. Where is this hospital going to be built? So out of lux and weirdness, she was flying to Kenya in, I think it was like 15 days. And I was flying to Kenya in 12 days. Because she called me up and said, uh, you know, like, and she didn't realize I was in America. Because she was asking me, do you want me to bring you, like, some bagels or whatever? <laughs> <laughs> so I picked her up from the airport in Eldoret and drove her to the site. And she was born 800 meters in that direction from where the site is. And then 800 meters in the opposite direction was where her house was. And then the weirdest thing, like after we got to know each other and a little bit more, she wanted, her father died in 1995. No, sorry, 2000, I think, 2019, 98 or something. So she wanted to take me to the birthplace of where her father came from. So we drove in the car. We left Eldoret. We left Place Blico Capsaret, then Mosoriet. And then, you know, we're driving further and further and further. Then we leave the tarmac road and we go onto the dirt road after an hour or so. Now we're driving on a dirt road and it becomes narrower and narrower and narrower. Finally, we come to the spot where her father was born in a field. He was a very, very poor guy. I'd actually built my school a thousand feet away, my first school. So this weird weirdness that destinies collide. I mean, what are the chances of that? And, but she told me, she said, no. She said, you know, my, one of my uh, relatives was one of the first people to fight the British in 1895. It was Koitilel Arab Samoy, this guy. And he was one of the first resistance fighters against the British. And he had predicted everything. And that's what he was. He was a soothsayer. So she said, no, 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 we believe in destiny, you know, in our tribe in Kenya because of how it is. And sure enough, even the fact was I used to train with uh, her brother-in-law, and you know, Patrick Sang, who is uh, the coach for Elliot Kipchoge, and Elliot is also an, an in-law to me. So it's such a small... So, and hence a great title, Running With Destiny. True <laughs> enough that it all becomes interwoven. I always say, you know, like, when you look back at life, you see everything you did make sense. But when you're walking through life, you don't really realize mm -hmm. it. And you never lose an opportunity. So, I mean, I say yes to every single opportunity because all those opportunities make sense mm -hmm. and everything. We are all intertwined. I mean, I think that's just the beautiful thing about this world. If you search somebody, listen to their story, you find a connection. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I just, we're reaching towards a close and I just want to read at the very, toward the very end. Here it is. Okay. It's when the hospital's dedicated and there's a quote that su summarizes the book's adventure, which is, I'm going to get choked up guys. Okay. Um, a dream project begun, founded upon little more than an optimistic spirit. <laughs> I just think, you know, your optimistic spirit, Toby, I mean, you are in no way qualified to do nearly like 80% no. of the things you've accomplished in life. And it's just such an inspiration. You know, sometimes oh, I think you. it's probably good not to know how challenging something's going to be like building, you know, whatever, a 15 million dollar hospital, how many? You know? I cut down the price in the end, but <laughs> and let me just tell you a, a short thing about fundraising. So I presumed what I'd do is I'd come back to New York and I had all these friends who, yeah. you know, wealthy people. So I thought what I'll do is I'll just type out an email, tell them about the problem, and then they'll each give me one million dollars. That was the plan. So I, <laughs> I got on the email, I sent it out, nobody responded. <laughs> And I was like, and believe you me, I would not have donated to myself. 
And my board, bar one person, also resigned. No, nobody <laughs> wanted to. They were like, you idiot. What are, you know, you're good at giving away shoes. I mean, that's your yeah. talent. What are you trying to? But at that time, Senator Obama was all the time on the airwaves saying, donate micro donations will get me to the White House. And I was thinking, like, hmm, well, if this man is trying to become the president of the United States <laughs> with, you know, small micro donations, why am I asking for millions of dollars? You know, why don't I ask for micro donations? So go small. So I changed my whole strategy through, through that idea. And yeah, you're right. I mean, it's just basically it was just taking advantage of what happens at the moment to try and because I didn't have any skills to to build and it actually was a, a big problem when I came to fundraising meetings when people heard about and th I didn't have a, dis a business plan either because it was changing so dramatically yeah. all the time it was kind of like I'd have to rewrite the business plan every other week for the meetings so by by good luck the building and we've actually treated over 800,000 kids and that these are the kids of the poorest poor in the world I mean it's a public hospital but they have to pay like little cost sharing like a dollar or two and we had a story just the other day this girl uh, she had maybe like 15 years old she had twins mm. and we told her she had to pay one dollar as uh, the co-pay she collapsed on the floor crying and crying and crying just say I can't do it oh. and I was like don't worry I mean I'll, I'll pay oh. I'll pay but she was so you know these are the people that we're dealing with it's yeah. not people that say oh you know I like you know, I'm feeling short of money this time. These are people that just, they don't actually interact with money. They live, you know, yeah. on squatter land. They cut weeds in the morning to actually boil in water. They collect firewood for, you know, this is, it's a different world. You know, we're in a, a rural area. We're not in an area where people have a lot of money. Mm. And so, yeah, I, as I say, I, I really feel I, I'm split in two. And that's why the cover of my book is good. We've got Manhattan and we've got Kenya. And, and that's Peter running. Farrago. It was a Barnes Nobles designer. It's he's really he's great. such a talented artist. And it was his concept that came up. You know, I wanted the map of Africa and da da da. He was like, no, totally. no this, this is, is really, what you want. This is fantastic. Well, the one thing I wanted to sort of say in closing, and you're welcome to comment on it, which is I get back to the, the prologue, which mm -hmm. again, when you were 14 and oh, paralyzed with fear on the rock face, that you decided I wanted to live for a worthwhile purpose, not for a personal experience. But reading this book, what a personal experience you've had. So I think you got the whole ball of wax, Toby. I mean, how do you feel? And I do feel that I've, I've been lucky. I've met some amazing people that have, you know, I mean, me alone, I'd have gone nowhere. I am really a team in my, in my book. I've been so fortunate to meet the greatest of people on the way and just had just a very, and it continues too. I mean, you know, now, I mean, I'm starting new projects as we speak and <laughs> just, Anything you want to tease out here or, or float? We, well, can, we have micro donors out there. For instance, I remember when Sami Wanjiro died, who was the run, I'm sure you remember, the Olympic champion that fell, pushed or whatever off the balcony and died. I remember the world majors had a meeting at that time and they were saying, like, we need to do something for the runners. Da, da, da. But the problem is, is when the runners get money, often, you know, becomes a certain arrogance. You know, now I'm a millionaire. I'm not going to listen to anybody. What about the girls and boys? I think in Kenya, we look after the the ones who are athletically talented. But I want to start a boys and girls club for athletics mm -hmm. in the, the hub of Kenyan running, which is a small town called Iten. So I'm going to start an after school club to try and actually instill values that, mm -hmm. you see, the skills we get in life are often to our surroundings. I remember there was a winner of the New York City Marathon. He brought his father to the Hilton Hotel and his father, who is incredibly talented, like he'll walk through the bush and he'll tell you, if you have that plant, it'll cure you for A, B, and C, mm, and mm. stuff that would actually dazzle me, and he was such an interesting... But for instance, he saw a man go into the elevator, and the door shut, and then it opened, he said, that's the chamber of death. He said, you go into that room, the door shut, and then... Because <laughs> he couldn't conceive the idea that it had gone up, yeah, you know, to, yeah, because he'd yeah. never seen... So we often think... we always, Ignorance is the wrong word. You know, it's not ignorance. It's just inside. Lack of his, familiarity. <laughs> it's, and I think what's happened in, you know, for instance, with the running problem, I, I see. So I, whenever I see a problem, you asked, why did I build a hospital? My charity has done the, the rainbow of every single cause. I mean, we've done FGM. We've done malaria awareness. We've done every single thing. AIDS early on. AIDS, exactly. Hookworm. Because we identify schools. I mean, I built six schools.
we identify a problem and then we find a solution for it. So I, I change the environment, and I think this is a good thing. I'm the only staff member for my charity, which, <laughs> <laughs> which helps me able to change the mission. Yeah. I mean, you'll see a lot of charities here. The only thing we're going to do is we're giving dinner. And yeah. that's all they'll do. Yeah. You know, if you're donating to us, we're going to do. But really, the holistic, if you want to lift people up, yeah. it's a big approach. You have to do every single thing. And so that's usually what I'm distracted. What can they say? <laughs> <laughs> In a good way. In I go all over way. the place. When I see a problem, I try to. I mean, again, going back to my theme, I believe we're all trying to be helpers. And when you're in New York, it's like you go into the wall and every single, there's plug sockets or outlets, as they call them here in America, everywhere. But you go to Kenya and there's one outlet in the mm. wall. So what, if I can bring the goodness of all these different people here mm -hmm. and take them over to an area and empower them, because I say my, my donors are angel investors in human life. Mm. And <laughs> so that's, that's you know, great. they are, they're a team with me and we go yeah. over there. And like I say, I take your donation to the destination. I don't pay a third party team who then goes and pays another one. Mm -hmm. And that's why over 50% of donations for Africa get lost oh. here in America before. So, oh. you know, where is your donation actually going? So I'm saying put your donation in the ground, actually make it work and mm -hmm. see the kids that you're helping. Fantastic. Well, this book was just such a treat. I really can't recommend it more heartily. Running with Destiny by Toby Tanzer. Um, thank you so much, Toby, and thank you, Manhattan Neighborhood Network and Will Sanchez for hosting us today. We really enjoyed this opportunity to talk with the author and my friend, Toby Tanser. Thank you, Toby. Thank you so much, Stacey. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. This was great. <laughs> really amazing. No, no, thank you. We could have talked for hours. <laughs> Knowing us, yeah. we'd need more bagels at that point. I though. know, exactly. Yeah. And coffee, too. Yeah. <laughs>